So I, I'll, I'll open with an anecdote about um, sort of about how clueless we generally are about where, where we are, what position we're actually in. Um, I did a reading years years ago um, at a church, a beautiful church with the uh, the amazing Alan Grossman, and I was extremely intimidated. I thought, oh my God, he's so amazing, and we're in a church, and I'm so profane, and I'm just this is going to be horrible. What am I doing? And um, and I was I was very I was very shy, and I felt very shut down during the reading. And then afterwards, this elderly woman came up to me, and she said, "Can I give you some advice?" And I had my guard up, and I was like oh no, it's going to be religious, she's going to tell me something about God, and some kind of a, some kind of a criticism about, you know, me, or how I was uh, blasphemous, or how I shouldn't have said those words in, in a church. Um, and she said, it blew my mind and changed my life, she said, it's time for you to grow out of your little girl voice and into your woman's voice. <laughs> it blew me away. I, I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, why are you why are you why are you acting like a child? <laughs> um, and I realized that because I was so embarrassed about um, reading in a church, and I was so, I felt so intimidated by reading with the great Alan Grossman that I had sort of shrunk, and I felt so embarrassed. I didn't want anyone to think that I actually thought I deserved to be there. So I gave a crap performance. I I, I sort of. Uh, mumbled and, and, and skittered away and acted small and realized what a, what a, um, how rude to the people who actually were there. How, you know, how rude to not actually give the people who got on trains, got on buses, got, got in taxis and got into that place on time to listen to poetry. How rude of me not to give them what they came for. Um, how rude to think of myself and my own anxiety um, instead of overcoming that anxiety and actually projecting, reading with some gusto, with some, with some commitment. Um, so that, that woman really changed my life. Um, and I'll never forget her. So that's a little bit about sort of how, how little we actually can see ourselves, how much we actually do need some feedback to, to get a sense of what, of what we're actually doing. Um, so that was, at the, that was when I, just had, I had a I had first book, and I was very un, uncertain and insecure. Um, and speaking of anxiety of audience, um, over the years of, of, of a writing life, I think that my anxiety about writing has changed with the very introduction of an audience. Um, there's this very real anxiety of trying to give readers, imaginaries they may be, what they want, um, a danger of playing to the house, um, even though the house is probably watching the football game at the sports bar that you're reading at and no one's really listening to you. Um, my point is, once you understand that people might be listening, you might also wonder if that changes what you're going to say. Um, writers are fond of saying that you become a different writer altogether once your parents die. Um, no longer looking over your shoulder to see how you might embarrass them in front of your other relatives. Younger writers are always worried about this, not wanting their folks to see the written proof that their offspring are having sex or drinking, or worse. So if we are to shrug off the opinions of the folks who have most shaped ourselves and our personalities, why should we care about the opinion of strangers, or more likely, no one? There's always some question of whether anyone's really listening, ever really reading. As a writer, one can't know for certain. That is, like all blessings and all curses, both a blessing and a curse. If no one is listening, we are free to enjoy the pleasures of solitude, of being alive in the world with no tethers or psychic reins besides those we cannot free ourselves from in our writing. No one is the boss of us on the page. What on earth might we be able to write then? No publisher or editor to please, no literary history to fit neatly into, no school of poetry to swim in no immortality to win, no deadlines, and likely nothing much to say. On the other hand, if someone is listening, reading, we can always let them down or prove their low expectations to be too high, sort of a lose-lose situation. <laughs> Unless we can find some bridge to the idea of an audience, a bridge that provides a mutually beneficial contract, a connecting that both celebrates and embraces the gifts of the writer and lavishes those gifts on the delighted recipient the reader, how to write in such a way, a way one might need to call libidinous. Um, so I have some thoughts about libidinous writing and not necessarily erotic writing, but sort of the connective energy um, 
one might call it love, which I, I, I will do. Um, you know, the pitfalls of writing we, we know pretty well. Beyond the problems of the blank page or having nothing to say and no one to say it to, um, we also are concerned about the possibility of being misunderstood. Um, they, they won't get us. That she'll say, that is not what I meant at all. As James Richardson says, quote, only half of writing is saying what you mean. The other half is preventing people from reading what they expected you to mean. So who are we talking about when we're talking about who's listening to us talk about love, when we talk about love, that is? Because ostensibly we write for love, to prove our loveworthiness, to prove that we are making adequate spiritual use of our temporary vessels of soul and life, to show that we're willing to connect, desperate to, that we want to be heard by other humans, that we want this utterance and reception to cure us of loneliness. But knowing this likely motive doesn't need to corral the whole genre of poetry into the realm of romantic, obsessive, or even erotic love. That's, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I want to suggest something more useful, more elastic, a way to write about everything with heart, including the heart. I like May, May Sarton's concept, all, love, all poems are love poems, but I believe that she meant something bigger and better than the narrowest interpretation of that. Love as a life force. Love as hope through death, through suffering. Most of all, love as a concept. Love, subject and motivation is useful to poets because it is about connection. May Sarton may have been widely quoted out of context. She actually says in Mrs. Stevens' Here's the Mermaid Singing, quote, when I said that all poems are love poems, I meant that the motor power, the electric current, is love of one kind or another. The subject may be something quite impersonal. So it's not just love poems that are verbing electrically from the writer to the lover, to the writer to the beloved, but all poems carry this kind of love electricity. The act of writing itself can be understood as a simple imperative, I love you, which invites us to think that the love in I love you is the velocity, the movement, the active verbs going somewhere. Where are they going? They're going from I to you. All verbs are the love in I love you. Love is all the verbs in the world, wrapped up in one word. When we think of I love you, we are apt to think of two lovers in blissful harmony. But we all know that love is not bliss. It is painful, devastating, difficult, tormenting, crazy, hateful, disastrous, alienating, strange, wicked, wild, confusing, soul-searing. And this is as it should be. Love is not happiness. It's catastrophe. Every love story we read shows us that if it's a good story. When love contains no conflict, we have a very boring story or poem. When happily ever after occurs in writing, the book had better be over, because there's no movement, no velocity, no urge, no drive, when we are all very happy and pleased with life. We put the book down. Why read or write when we have achieved nirvana, when we have no maddening itch we much, must scratch? No, the lover and the beloved, that is, the writer and the reader, are not joined in happy union. They are split apart and stuck together by a verb, an action, a poem, a plot, a narrative. This is the writing. The lover is the writer. The beloved is the reader. The only way of getting these two together is by rickety bridge through a strange and dark wood, a poem, a story. The reader and the writer, the lover and the beloved. These are two ways of saying the same thing. The two alien minds trying to share a world. It's nearly impossible. A lover's goal is to get the beloved to understand his or her private world of meaning. A writer's goal is the same. A writer must somehow woo and win the reader, lure the reader into the private world, and make this private world make sense outside the native atmosphere. That is, a writer has the same job as making a boat fly on land or teaching a giraffe to eat buffalo wings with chopsticks. <laughs> Impossible tasks made possible because the writer wants very badly to change the reader make the reader into something different than she was before she read. The writer must have a very strong motive indeed. The motive is that the world we make means everything to us, and we don't want to live there alone. We want company. Um, but if we want our beloved to come over and pick up our, uh, come over to our private land, we'd better have some understanding of what our own motives, of what their motives are to come to the to come to the work, what might bring them there. We'd better find out if our beloved is a vegetarian or not before we prepare a big rack of ribs for their first dinner at our house. We will need to meet our beloved halfway or risk being abandoned, our books sold back to the Strand. 